Edward John Smith and he was quite a seasoned campaigner. In fact, he was considered to be the best captain of the whole uh, Starline fleet. Because of his experience and his capabilities, he attracted people to him and in fact many employees requested to be on the same ship as he was because he had such a great reputation as a captain. However, tragically, on the night of the 14th, his leadership was called or has been called into question. For one thing, he ignored the iceberg warnings. He was warned that there were icebergs around and he ignored those warnings. Secondly, he refused to cut his speed. Then after the collision with the iceberg, his, uh, he seemed to lose all confidence in his own capacities to lead. He was very slow in ordering the lifeboats to be filled and then to be lowered. He isolated himself on the bridge of the ship and he didn't pass on critical information to other members of the crew. And so his incompetence, in a sense, in a way, uh, helped to, uh, to result in the loss of 1,500 lives. Now, there are two other captains of ships involved in that incident on that night, but they're names and ships that you're probably not as familiar with. The hero was one Captain Arthur Rostron of the Carpathia. Now, as soon as he heard the distress signals from the Titanic, he changed his ship's course immediately and went straight to where the last signal came from. And he is the captain of the ship who was responsible for taking 750 people out of lifeboats. So he rescued all those people who managed to get into lifeboats. However, the villain, although his descendants do contest it, was one uh, Captain Stanley Lord of the California. Now, the California was a ship that was on a very similar course to the, to the Titanic, but it had stopped that night because of the icebergs. So at least the captain was good in that respect. However, his crew saw the Titanic coming and so they kept a watch on the Titanic and the evidence is that they even saw the distress flares go up. But for some reason, the captain refused to act. And by the time that he did move his ship to where the Titanic was, the uh, Carpathia had already taken all the people out of the lifeboats. That ship, by the way, the California, was only four or five miles away from the Titanic. So conceivably, it could have been involved in, in a mass rescue, saved many more lives. All that to say that it is critical for any organisation to do well, it must have good leadership. Whether that organisation be a ship, or whether it be a government, whether it be a company, whether it be a church, or whether it be a family, its success rises and falls really on the quality of its leadership. And we at this church want to be known for having good leadership and promoting good leadership. And so therefore the question comes, well, what constitutes a good leader? Jeff talked a little bit about this last week. But what are the qualities and what are the principles by which good leadership um, thrives, as it were? Well, to answer that, can you turn your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. And what I want to do is, first of all, take you through the passage. It's only the first seven verses. And then having taken you through the passage, I want to draw out seven principles for good godly leadership. But first of all, Acts chapter 6. Let's read from verses 1 down through to verse 7. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Pacorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicholas, 
a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles and after praying they laid their hands on them. The word of God kept on spreading and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were coming obedient to the faith. The book of Acts, in one sense, is about the, the growth and thriving of the early church. And what we see in the book of Acts is that the church manages to grow even in spite of both external and internal opposition or problems. So throughout the book of Acts, basically you move from an internal difficulty to an external difficulty, back to an internal problem, out to an external problem. And so now here we, we've come to another internal issue that the church needed to face if it was going to uh, be successful and continue to thrive and accomplish the purpose for which God had it. What was at stake here was the unity of the church. And the unity of the church is a key issue in the book of Acts. Go back to chapter 1 and verse 14. Chapter 1, verse 14 of the book of Acts. It says, these are the, the believers. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women. Okay. Jump over to chapter 2. Look at two, chapter 2, verse 46. Again, describing the internal workings of the church. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. So they had one mind. There was unity. Have a look over at chapter 4 and verse 24. This is after the apostles have been released from custody. They go back to their brethren and they, they pray. And it says, When they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord. In unity, all of the believers were together praying to God. Jump down to verse 32. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And so you get to chapter 4, verse 32, and the church is characterised by unity, by togetherness. They're all thinking the same thing in terms of we're here to extend God's kingdom on earth. We're here with a purpose, with a mission, and we believe in one another, we're investing in one another, and we're in this together. Now, after 4.32, the first internal problem arises, and that's Ananiah and Sapphira, who threaten the church with disunity. But that issue is, is quickly dealt with via church discipline. And if you like, that leaven that was corrupting or threatened to corrupt the loaf was cut out. That was the first problem. But when we come back over to our text in chapter 6, we have a second problem. And this one is not quite as straightforward in a sense as the Ananiah and Sapphira problem. Because this issue is a little bit more complex and you can't just deal with this issue by getting rid of the people who are the problem. And so we see the, 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 the church having to deal with a, with a conflict that is threatening their unity because you've got Greek-speaking Jews complaining against Hebrew-speaking Jews. And so in this early church, which constitutes thousands of people, by the way, and it's in Jerusalem, but you've got a divide along ethnic grounds. They're all Jews but some are Hebrew Jews who, from Palestine who speak Hebrew and others are Greek Jews who maybe don't have Hebrew as their mother tongue. And that would mean that if, they're, uh, if these widows particularly are Greek speakers in an in a Aramaic or a Hebrew environment, then they're probably on the, on the uh, social marginal lines. And it seems that these he, uh, the Greek-speaking widows were, were being neglected or looked over when it came to the distribution of the food because you remember that in the early church some people sold everything they had and they got the money and they put it into a, in a kitty and from that kitty the funds were distributed to people as they had need, right? That's what they were doing. We see that in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. Well, that all sounds great in theory but there are problems and here is the first problem that comes from that, practically speaking, that we're aware of and that is... How do you go about distributing that money so that everybody gets an even share and everybody's needs are met? Well, the Greeks thought that their widows weren't getting their equal share and their needs weren't being met and so they raised this complaint to the apostles. The apostles, very interestingly, didn't deny the problem. Rather, they tackled it head on. So in verse 2 they said, 
we recognise that this is a problem and we need to deal with it and here's how it's going to be dealt with. But they don't actually deal with the problem themselves. And what they do is they say, we've got more important things to be concerned about, which is repeated in verse 2 and verse 4, rather select from yourselves seven godly men who will take care of this issue for us. And the congregation said, that sounds good to us. And so away they go. Three qualifications for these men are listed to us in verse, uh, listed for us in verse 3. They have to be men of good reputation, which means good reputation in the community, so that they have a testimony of being fine, outstanding individuals within the church and within society. Secondly, they needed to be full of the spirit and then thirdly, full of wisdom. So these are men of faith, men of uh, mature spirituality, men who are wise, who, who uh, are able to live well. Well, the congregation took this task on board. Verse 5, the statement found approval with the whole congregation and I think Luke tells us that the church is moving back towards unity. You've got disunity in verse 1 and when the, the, uh, the apostles come up with a strategy... It pleases the congregation so they're moving towards unity. They think this is a good idea. And so they choose seven men and they're listed for us in verse 5. And these seven men, their names are very interesting because all their names are Greek. Now up to this point the leaders were all Palestinian Jews. The apostles, the twelve apostles were Hebrews, Hebrews, Hebrew Jews whereas these seven all have Greek names. So there's a possibility that that each of these seven men were Jews who spoke as their first language Greek, which means that the leadership of the early church was breaking out of its Hebrew confines and they were now bringing into the leadership men who were not just um, from Palestine. And in turn, these men would be used by God to take the gospel to other places outside of Palestine. So this is a transitional passage which shows that the church is growing and it's maturing because it's broadening the basis for its leadership. Two men in this list uh, Luke underlines and he does that by adding an editorial note. It's the first and it's the last. You'll notice he says they chose Stephen and then he gives an editorial note, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And he does that because Stephen's going to be a pivotal character in the rest of chapter 6 and in chapter 7. And Stephen, in fact, is going to not just wait on these tables and solve this this problem between these groups of widows, but he's also going to become a great apologist for the faith and a great preacher and a great debater, as we see in the rest of chapter 6. And then in chapter 7, he's going to be arrested and tried and he's going to give this wonderful defence of the faith And in a sense, he's going to help the church to mature by breaking its dependence upon the temple and Jerusalem. And so he's going to be a a, a very important transitional figure for the early church. He's also the first recorded church martyr. The last guy on the list is Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. Now that's significant because a proselyte was a Gentile who converted to Judaism. So you could say that Nicholas is the first Gentile that we're aware of who was a a fully-fledged member and leader in the early church. Very significant. Because from this point on, chapters 6 and 7, if you like, record the, the final rejection of the gospel by the Jewish authorities. And after chapters 6 and 7, the gospel goes forth outside of Palestine into Samaria and into the rest of the world. And... Nicholas, as a a resident from Antioch, is kind of um, a precursor to that. Antioch is going to be a key city in the early church. It's going to be Paul's home city. It's going to be a missionary sending city. And so what Luke seems to be doing in this passage is introducing us to key figures who will be involved in the growth of the church in subsequent chapters. Another key figure listed in, in this list is Philip. And Philip's going to be the man in chapter 8 who takes the gospel to the Gentiles, to the Samaritans in the early part and then to the Ethiopian eunuch in the second part of Acts chapter 8. So you've got some key men here who are being listed for us. Verse 
The church selects these men and in verse 6 they bring them before the apostles and the apostles pray for them and lay their hands on them. They lay their hands on them to signify that they're, they're invested with authority from the apostles and of course they have the approval of the apostles. And then Luke records in verse 7 that the church continues to prosper. So it's like Luke is saying, look how this worked. The church had a problem. The church appointed men to solve the problem. The problem was solved and as a result the church grew. So when the church dealt honestly and openly and well with internal issues, it actually fostered and helped the church to grow. That seems to be what Luke is saying, giving a big tick of approval to this whole process. Okay, let's now run through some principles for godly leadership. And as we run through these principles, it's kind of like a twofold application for us here. One is more general in terms of as a church. I want you to be thinking as a a part of New Community Church. We want to be a church known for, for our good leadership and for developing leadership. So as we look, as we go through this list, I want you to be thinking how do we rate as a church with respect to these principles? And maybe afterwards you might like to have a chat to to one of the leaders about your thoughts. Secondly, each of you should be aspiring to be some kind of spiritual leader, whether it be in the home, whether it be in the workplace, with children, whatever it might be. And so you can use this also to self-analyse and say, okay, how do I stack up with these principles? Are these principles at work in my life? Am I grasping them? Okay, first principle... Good godly leadership recognises that conflict in the church is inevitable. Good godly leadership recognises that conflict in the church is inevitable. Verse 1, a complaint it was lodged and the apostles recognised the complaint as legitimate. They didn't treat the complaint as an attack upon their authority they didn't treat the complaint as an attack upon their personal character. Nor did they cast aspersions upon those who issued the complaint as though to imply that if you ever complained against the authorities in this church, then you must be spiritually immature. Now, the opposite of this principle is the head-in-the-sand approach to problems. So that happens often in churches where the leaders lack self assurance. So often they will refuse to acknowledge that a problem exists thinking that if they do it will undermine their authority. In other cases if anybody ever raises a problem or an issue then the pastor or the leaders can often take that personally as a, as a, as a uh, criticism of them and so they get very defensive. Um, I refer to this as the Moses syndrome and I'm thankful to say that I don't believe Jeff suffers from the Moses syndrome. He's a good guy. But the Moses sin, Moses was the sole mediator of God's truth to the congregation. And some leaders, church leaders, pastors that I've come across, and maybe even I've been guilty of this when I was in the pastorate to a a degree, get the feeling that they are the mediator of God's truth to a particular group of people. And if any one of that group of people should dare question them or raise a problem, then they're speaking against the Lord's anointed. And how dare you speak against the Lord's anointed? You obviously are spiritually immature and are out of whack. And so therefore either the people get shot down or the, or the problem is not even acknowledged. That kind of a, a leadership fosters um, fear. Certainly it fosters frustration. It takes courage and honesty for leaders to admit that problems arise. But it's the only way to go if the church is going to be healthy because by allowing contrary views to be expressed and acknowledged, an atmosphere of grace and cooperation can start to be developed. That doesn't mean that after the service you all have to race up to Jeff and sort of tell you all all the problems, but... Nonetheless, there needs to be an openness on part of the leadership to listen to the congregation. I like what Johnson says here. He's a commentator. He says, Frustration and misunderstandings are not abnormal when different kinds of people live and work together. 
Sometimes we suffer from an idealism. There is nothing automatic about expressing Christ's love in a multicultural or multiracial situation. Preserving and expressing our oneness in Christ demands strenuous effort. So the first principle of good godly leadership is to acknowledge that problems will arise. They inevitably arise within a church. Second principle of good leadership, it addresses issues head on. Good leadership addresses issues head on. You'll notice that from what we're told, as soon as the apostles become aware of the problem, they do something about it. Now, they themselves don't actually tackle the issue, but they make sure that the issue is dealt with. They do something about it. Now, the opposite of this principle is inaction. You call this the political principle. You acknowledge that there's a problem, but then you refer it to a subcommittee or you just go into a round of discussions or you somehow postpone having to actually deal with the issue. It's the, uh, the principle of inaction. Um, while you don't want to forsake due process, it's often best to move more quickly than it is to move more slowly, particularly when you have issues involving people. Most problems within a church are going to be people problems and people problems need to be dealt with as soon as you possibly can. Otherwise, stuff festers and resentment starts to build and, um, and that can only result in, in, in bad fruit developing. So good leadership addresses issues head on. It doesn't seek to postpone dealing with the issues. Third principle, good leadership cares for the poor and the vulnerable. Good leadership cares for the poor and the vulnerable. This is implied in the passage. It's also implied in the previous passages where the church was selling what they had or people within the church were selling what they had and giving it to the collective so that people's needs could be dealt with. And it's also implied in this passage because the apostles say, yep, this is a, a ministry that we have going that we believe in and we need to get this solved. And so good leadership cares for the poor and the vulnerable. Uh, the Old Testament makes it clear that, that the way that the people of God relate to the poor in society is a barometer of their spiritual health. So Deuteronomy chapter 10, the prophets like Isaiah, uh, Amos, um, Micah, Malachi, most of the prophets in fact, all bring this to, for, bring this to the fore. Uh, Jesus reinforced it in his teachings. How the people of God as a community relate to the poor and the vulnerable is a barometer of their spiritual health. And so good leadership will make it a concern and they'll make sure that they are the voice for those who don't have a voice. They'll stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves. The opposite, of course, of this principle is social inaction or indifference. And that's a principle that maybe too many conservative evangelical churches have been guilty of. Fourth principle, good leadership recruits leaders. Good leadership recruits more leaders. That's what I've got there. Recruits other leaders. Uh, you see this in that the apostles say, go choose for yourself seven men who have these qualifications. So they believed in the 2 Timothy 2.2 2 principle. It's a, a verse that we have shoved down our throats when we went through Bible college in the early 90s. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. You've got to Teach the word of God to faithful men who will be able to impart it to others also. The whole idea of multiplication and discipleship. Leadership is a team enterprise and good leaders are constantly on the lookout to recruit and train up other leaders. Um, this is always the way that it's been. So you've got Moses with Joshua, you have Elijah with Elisha, uh, you have Jesus with the Twelve, you have Barnabas with Paul, you have uh, Timoth uh, Paul with Timothy and so on. Always be on the lookout for those that you can bring along and encourage and develop. Good leadership is one that seeks to recruit other leaders. Always be thinking about the next generation. Always be thinking about the future. The opposite of this principle, by the way, is the 
Lone Ranger principle. And that is where one person, one man, one pastor does it all. And if he doesn't do it all, he controls it all. That is a model of church leadership that was very um, uh, common for generations and still you'll find it in many churches even today where you've got basically a, a, a localised pope who either does everything or at least controls everything. And yet again, that kind of model, I believe, leads to that aforementioned Moses syndrome. It disempowers people and cultivates um, the wrong kind of atmosphere in a church. And it can even lead to the burnout of the leader himself. So good leaders seek to recruit others. Fifth principle is related to that. Good leaders delegate responsibility or they empower others. Good leaders delegate responsibility or they empower other people. It's not just enough to recruit leaders and to train leaders. You need to develop them and empower them by giving them responsibility. So what I love about this is that the apostles in this passage say, we don't want to do this. We think if we tackle this problem, it will take away from our main priority. So we want you to raise to call out seven men who will do it for us. And that's all they say about the problem. So you get the seven men who come in and it's their job to fix the problem. Basically with no further instruction, as far as we're told, from the apostles. So not only are these men chosen, but they're empowered. And so here's the problem. You use your creativity, you use your skills, use your abilities, your nous, your networking, you work it out. We're off doing something else. So that's empowerment and that's what good leadership does. Sixth principle. You're flying through these. It's good because Janet's got to leave early so I've got to try and get through this. Principle number six. Good leadership keeps the main thing the main thing. Luke emphasises this because he repeats it in verses two and verses four. The apostles say it is not good for us to leave the word of God to serve tables. And in verse 4 he says, but we will devote ourselves, and that's a word that's that's repeated throughout the book of Acts, these early chapters, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the word of God. So he says it twice. Good leadership keeps the main thing the main thing. It is so easy to allow the tyranny of the urgent to take away from the essential. And because you've got so much clamour here, there and everywhere for your services that often you'll be running after this, that and the other and not doing what you've actually been designated to do. Now for the leaders of a church, they need to be the shepherds of the people and the most important thing that a shepherd can do is feed his flock. And to feed the flock, the shepherd needs to be able to devote himself to prayer and to the word of God. But for in order for them to be able to do that, other people must do the other stuff. That's the principle. And so it's the idea of where you have all members being involved in the ministry, people working in their areas of strength and their areas of ability, people doing varied things in order to take the load off the shepherds who can do the preaching, the studying of the word of God and prayer. Good leadership keeps the main thing the main thing. Very important. Seventh principle. Good leadership protects and facilitates unity. Good leadership protects and facilitates unity. I wonder how this problem would be addressed today in some circles. You read verse 1. The Hellenistic, the Greek Jews, the Greek Christians or the Greek Jewish Christians were complaining against the Hebrew Jewish Christians. I know the solution. Two different churches... We need to have a Greek church over here and a Hebrew church over there, get the antagonists apart and then that will be fine. Well, it's two denominations. If we're Baptists, two denominations. Um, or if, if, if you don't like that, let's have two different services. Let's have a Hebrew-speaking service followed by a Greek-speaking service. Let's do whatever we can do to get these people apart from one another. That's how we think today. And that's why the Protestant church is the way that it is today. There's a problem and so Protestants break. Another problem arises and so they break again. 
Another difference arises, so they break again. And what we have in Protestantism today is just a, a, a shattered and scattered church. That's not how the apostles dealt with it. They said, no, nope, there's some tension here, there's some problems, it's related to, to culture, it's related to our ethnic background, but we're going to deal with it. We're going to try and make this baby work and that's going to require some hard work, some self-sacrifice, some effort, but that's the way that we're going to go. And surely this is the model for us. Different people different ages, different cultures, different backgrounds, all working together to further God's kingdom in spite of our differences and different preferences. All of us making some degree of personal sacrifice in order to hang together for the sake of unity so that we might have a strong testimony to a very fractured world, a world where division and separation is commonplace. A world where with, if ever you have a difference with somebody, all you do is walk away and break. It happens in marriages. If there's a problem, you walk away and break it. it happens in, in the workplace. If there's a problem, walk away, find another job. It happens in friendships. If someone offends you, just walk away, find another friend. Our world is characterised by division and by brokenness and by separation. So surely one of the key strategies of the church is to be a strong witness to this fractured and fragmented world by stressing and, and living out this unity. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 17, that they may be one as we are one. John 13, 34, 35, by this will all men know that they are my disciples, that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. If even though there are real problems among the congregation, you still actually have love for one another and will hang in there with each other and work out those differences. That's why we've got such great potential, even in this church. We're a small church, but we're ethnically diverse. So we've got folk from different nations here who will have different preferences and different ways of thinking and different ideas. So we've got great potential here to really be a strong witness, to be a... a a united church. Good leadership works to protect and facilitate that unity. Again, let me close with a quote here from Johnson again. He says, The solution to the tensions is not to reduce the variety in the church. When a congregation begins to reach out and draw in people from a different cultural or social group, comfortable routines and long-held assumptions will be disturbed. The temptation to segregate ourselves into distinct homogenous fellowships, each at home in its own comfort zone, is very strong. But Acts points in the opposite direction. The solution to the tensions was not segregation, but selfless love. The apostles acknowledged the problems without defensiveness or impatience. They acknowledge their own limitations. So there you have seven principles of good godly leadership. So again, in terms of practical application, think about our church with respect to these seven principles. How are we doing? How do we stack up? Where can we improve? And you might have some thoughts that you might want to communicate to elders or to deacons. Secondly, with respect to your own leadership development, to your own development, as a Christian, how do you stack up? Maybe you can pick one or two of those principles and say, I need to work in this area. I need to become less defensive when people criticise me. Maybe that's the issue. When someone raises a complaint to me, maybe I shouldn't just snap their head off. Maybe I should listen. Maybe you need to work on that. Maybe you need to show more concern for the poor and the vulnerable. Maybe you need to be seeking to mentor somebody. Who in that generation coming behind you do you see as a potential leader who you could have input into? Are you keeping the main thing the main thing? So maybe there's one or two of those principles that you could work on personally.